This will be the part two of two lecture notes for the ionic basis of action potentials. And so we are going to begin with the rapid depolarization phase of the action potential. So here we are assuming that threshold has been reached. Again, we had an excitatory postsynaptic potential, which brought the membrane potential to negative 55 millivolts, which generated an action potential at the axon hillock. So in rapid depolarization, this is number three. And in rapid depolarization, your membrane potential is going to be changing from negative 55 millivolts toward positive 30 millivolts. But we, what we want to know is why, right? In physiology, we always ask why. So we want to look at how does that membrane potential become more positive? Well, that's going to be dealing with the configuration of your voltage-gated ion channels. So let's look at the voltage-gated sodium activation gate. So as you can see here, the activation gate now is open. So at negative 55 millivolts, these voltage-gated sodium activation gates begin to open. And so they don't all open at once along the length of the axon, but they open in a progressive fashion. So one channel opens, and the next channel opens, and the next channel opens, and so on. Now the voltage-gated inactivation gates are open. However, when the activation gate opens, that is going to trigger the receptor for the inactivation gate. And when you trigger the receptor for the inactivation gate, that tells the inactivation gate to close. It is only triggered. That's important. Meaning it's still open, but it's been triggered to close. Remember that the inactivation gate is slow. Now, the other thing that happens is that the voltage-gated potassium channels, yes, when you look at the diagram, they are closed. However, voltage-gated channels are always stimulated to open when there's a change in the membrane potential. So we've had a change in the membrane potential to negative 55 millivolts. So yes, that will stimulate voltage-gated potassium channels to open. However, they are only triggered. Remember, they're slow. So they are not open at this point. They're slow to open. So they're closed, but they're slowly opening, but they're never actually open during this phase of the action potential. When we look at the configuration of these channels and potassium channels are closed, voltage-gated sodium channels are open, you can look at sodium and how sodium is going to be moving into the cell along its electrochemical gradient. So if we have positive charges moving into the cell, that will force your membrane potential to become more positive or less negative. So that's what's calling, causing the depolarization is a sodium influx into the cell. So let's look at why this depolarization is called rapid depol. With these voltage-gated sodium channels, and we're at the axon hillock, and the membrane potential has reached negative 55 millivolts. So that means the activation gate is going to open. And when the activation gate opens, sodium can move into the cell carrying a positive charge. Now, did that change the membrane potential at that part of your neuron? Hopefully you answered yes. And because it changed the membrane potential there, that stimulates the next voltage-gated channel to open and sodium will move into the cell, bringing more positive charges with it. And then that change in the membrane potential will stimulate the next voltage-gated channel to open, and therefore sodium comes into the cell once again. So we've entered into a, a type of feedback that you should probably be familiar with, and we're enhancing a change. So this is called positive feedback. And so positive feedback is the reason that the slope of rapid depolarization is so steep. So the next phase of your action potential then is called repolarization. And in repolarization, this begins at the peak. So it begins here at number four, and then it continues until the membrane potential reaches negative 70 millivolts. So repol then goes from positive 30, when your membrane potential goes from positive 30 millivolts, back down to negative 70 millivolts. So let's look at what's causing this, what's responsible for this. 
So by the time you reach positive 30 millivolts, the sodium inactivation gate, remember it was triggered to close and depole? Well, now it's closed. It was so slow that it took it all to get to repole before it closed. The activation gate is still open, but if the activation gate is open and the inactivation gate is closed, as you see in your diagram, can sodium move into the cell? No, you can have no sodium influx at this point because one of the gates is closed. Now remember the voltage-gated potassium channels were triggered to open during depolarization, but they're so slow that they don't actually open until repole. And so please realize that this is a dynamic process. When the peak of your action potential here is reached, that does not imply that all of your activation gates are open and all of your inactivation gates close all at once. It's dynamic. It moves down the length of the axon. And the same is true for the voltage-gated potassium channels. They do not all pop open at once. It occurs progressively down the length of the axon. Let's take a look at the configuration of your voltage-gated sodium channels. Here we have the voltage-gated activation gate is open. The inactivation gate is closed. This is the closed and incapable of opening configuration. In other words, what this means is that these gates have been inactivated. So if we close the inactivation gate, in other words, this neuron cannot respond to another stimulation. These gates rather are closed and they're incapable of opening, so they cannot respond to another stimulus. What refractory period would this be? I'll leave that an open-ended question for you to figure out. Now the next phase of the action potential then is hyperpolarization. So in hyperpolarization, your membrane potential is going to become more negative than rest. So hyperpolarization occurs when the membrane potential goes from negative 70 millivolts down to about negative 80 or negative 85 millivolts. So again, let's look at what's causing hyperpolarization. At this point in time, your voltage-gated activation gates are now closed. And again, it's dynamic, so they don't all close right at the beginning of hyperpole, but throughout hyperpolarization, they close. The voltage-gated sodium inactivation gates, they close temporarily. Remember we said that the inactivation gates respond to whatever the activation gate does? So if the activation gate closes, the inactivation gate is going to be closed, but then it will pop open. So there's only a split second there where both of those gates are actually closed. The voltage-gated potassium channels begin to close at negative 70. And remember, they are slow to close. So if they're starting to close at negative 70, but yet they're really slow to close, can you still have potassium efflux occurring? Remember, we had potassium efflux occurring during repolarization, and that's why the membrane became more negative in repole. So potassium here is still exiting the cell because the potassium channels are slow to close, you still have some potassium efflux. And that's what's causing the membrane potential to become more negative than rest. Eventually, those voltage-gated potassium channels will be closed. And by the time you reach about negative 80 millivolts or negative 85 millivolts, they are actually closed by that point in time. Now, Let's once again look at the configuration of your voltage-gated sodium channels. So during hyperpolarization or near hyperpolarization, your voltage-gated sodium channels, the activation gate is closed and the inactivation gate is open. And so here, remember that this is the closed but capable of opening configuration. And the reason it's capable of opening is because the voltage-gated activation gate is the one that responds to a change in the membrane potential. So if a new stimulus comes along and that gate's closed, it will respond to a change in the membrane potential. If the gate's already open, it cannot respond to a change in the membrane potential. So in this case, in this configuration where the gates are closed but capable of opening, you're in another type of refractory period. And I'm just going to leave it up to you to decide which refractory period that this is. So now hyperpolarization is over, and we're going to assume that there's no new stimulus. So remember, during depolarization, you had sodium influx, 
So sodium ions entered the neuron, causing the neuron to become more positive, and that's why depolarization occurred. During repolarization, we had potassium efflux, so positive charges leaving the neuron and therefore causing the neuron to become more negative or the membrane potential to become more negative. So now we need to restore our ion distributions. One thing that's really important to understand is that yes, there were ions moving during the action potential. However, it's very little ion movement actually taking place. So we can restore the ion distributions using the sodium potassium pump and the leak channels. They can work together to restore the ion distributions. So my question for you is, does this event have to be completed before the neuron can be stimulated again? In other words, do you have to restore the ion distribution before that neuron can respond again? I'll give you a little hint. Think about the configuration of the voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay, so now the cell is returned to rest, and it's returned to rest by using the sodium potassium pump and the leak channels as well. So we've restored your ion distributions. Your voltage-gated activation gate for sodium is closed. Your inactivation gate is open. Your voltage-gated potassium channels are closed. And that's the end of the action potential for this neuron. So this neuron has responded to some stimulus, and now the stimulus is gone, so it has stopped responding. So that is the end of this segment. Thank you for listening.